गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी कैन यस यस गो मॉर्निंग आई कैन हियर यू या पेशन बिगेन प्लीज यस ओके आई वेलकम Welcome to Indian Diaspora Leadership Dialogue, program hosted by News India Political Action Committee. My name is Prasun Sivala, and along with my colleagues Sanjay Puri, Chairman U.S. Impact, Govinda Sachdev, Director India Affairs, greet the joiners of this program. For the purpose of smooth operations, we'll keep our participants on mute. To submit questions, please use the online chat box or send questions via email to events at usimpact.com. Today's topic of discussion is the India Budget. What promise it holds for the growth of India's economy? Now I invite Sanjay Puri, Chairman of US Impact, to address the joiners of this call. Thanks, Preston. Um, it's a real pleasure to host a very, very distinguished panel today on a very, very important subject, which is the uh, budget uh, uh, discussion, the India budget discussion. Um, as we know, this budget exercise is a unique exercise that uh, India. holds every year which is uh, very very different from the us standpoint uh, americans uh, really obviously have a don't have the understanding that the importance of the budget so we are really uh, very very uh, uh, lucky that we have some fantastic panelists who are going to kind of help us uh, simply understand this uh, for our panelists we have a large uh, number of listeners who are uh, part of the indian american diaspora members of uh, uh, congress uh, their staffers think tank people this is also recorded and posted and mailed out to think tanks analysts etc so this gets a very wide reach this is a, a dialogue that we began 6 months ago right before the elections uh, and it has continued on taking different topics of interest uh, with that i'll introduce uh, rabindra sachde who is the head of our india affairs who will take the program forward rabindra mm -hmm. thank you so much sanjay and thank you prasen and once again welcome to our callers and listeners on to this uh, leadership dialogues and we are absolutely delighted to have some three eminent minds with us to discuss and analyze the indian budget the union budget of india as sanjay said yes uh, not many people across the globe have an idea of the importance uh, which plays out with respect to the budget in india now without much ado Uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker. I hope and I believe we have Mr. Sheshadri Chaturji on the uh, logged in with us, please. Yes. Sheshadri ji, can yeah, I am great. here? Great, sir. Uh, Mr. Sheshadri Chaturji is a noted social activist yeah. and thinker. He has been the editor of the Organizer Weekly, a regular speaker at intellectual debates and discussions. Shri Chaturji ji has also been the member of the National Executive of the Bharatiya Janata Party and is a spokesman a spokesperson of the party. Without further ado. May I invite you, Sir Shahid Chari ji, to give us about uh, some of your perspectives on this budget in about three to four to five minutes. Your initial thoughts about this budget, for the benefit of our listeners, as Sanjay said, members of the Indian diaspora, congregation staffers, media people, investment bankers, and the lot. The floor is yours, Sir. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful program. I'm really grateful to you that you are able to do this kind of a thing, and. Uh, Uh, as you very rightly pointed out the budget uh, presentation in india is not uh, just an ordinary uh, event of uh, taking stock of uh, income and expenditure it also uh, has a lot more to do with uh, the direction that the indian economy in uh, particular and the country as a whole is going to take Uh, as we all know very well <clears throat> sometime in 1991 92 93 especially 93 onwards india switched on the basic socialist economy to a free market economy mode 
and that is when we also jettisoned some of the old socialistic policies and started looking towards a free economic growth. Uh, that also brought in focus the Look East policy, but unfortunately that did not uh, really take off because of uh, so many other factors. Uh, the last 10 years of uh, uh, one of the best economic uh, mind the country, Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, could have been a very, very interesting uh, growth-oriented uh, uh, period. But unfortunately, the first five years of his government was supported by the leftist. So that brought down the economic growth and it also took us on a different path. And the next five years, we had a number of uh, problems. So as a result of all this, it became a non-functional, economically non-functional government. So this is what we have inherited in 2014. And I think this is the time, the first time, the finance minister has laid out a blueprint for a growth-oriented economy. So I look at this budget as the starting point for India uh, uh, to to take to embark on an economic uh, growth trajectory. So I look at it as a starting point. So I think if you look at this whole budget exercise from that point of view, uh, there are many more things that we have to do. So uh, we can ask that we have done whatever we can do. This is, as I said, this is the first step that we have taken towards turning in a different kind of a setup. Uh, over. Thank you, sir, for your opening remarks. I think you've laid out some very interesting points, and first being that it's the start of a new growth-oriented era. And I think, as very rightly also said, the budget is not only an income, yeah. uh, income or a revenue income expense statement, but also more a pol socio-political statement from whichever the government is in power that day. And also your point yeah. about the look policy, on which we realize that, yeah. yes, there is really some punch being put into it because we see some budgetary allocations for the look east policy uh, of the government. Uh, wonderful, yeah. sir. We have some questions for you which have come to us earlier when we announced about this dialogue today and more will be okay. coming in via the chat. Uh, before I take them, may I also invite uh, the other panelists to make their opening comments, sir, and then we get into the Q&A, please. Yeah. Uh, May I now invite uh, Dr. Ajay Chibber? I hope and I believe uh, we have Dr. Ajay Chibber with us online uh, with us, sir. Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Great. Uh, may I take up two minutes to introduce you, please? Dr. Ajay Chibber is a visiting scholar at the Institute of International Economic Policy at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. He was India's first Director General of Independent, uh, Independent Evaluation with the status of a Minister of State. Prior to this, he was also based in New York as UN Assistant Secretary General and Assistant Administrator at the UNDP. Without much ado, may I invite Dr. Chibber for his opening thoughts and comments on the budget as he sees it, sir. Well, thank you very much and thank you also to US INPAC for this invitation. I really uh, appreciate this and also to Mr. Chari for his remarks. Um, as you said, as Mr. Suri said earlier, you know, and you said too, uh, you know, the budget doesn't get that much attention in the U.S., but in India it gets huge attention because it not only is a, a statement of numbers, but it lays out the orientation of the government. I, last year I called it like a being on a moonshot. It's like, uh, you know, when the first time you're trying to send a rocket to the moon, it gets that much attention. Uh, but um, uh, that said, I think this year's budget got particular attention because uh, when the first budget of this government was presented, it had been only in power for a, for, for a few weeks and pretty much took on um, the same budget as the previous UPA government. But this time the anticipation on this budget has been extremely high. And it's a budget that follows the Prime Minister's sort of moniker, which is Sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas, so it's called Sabka Budget. And in a way, it does, tries to do a, 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 
a little bit for everybody. It is, uh, of course, uh, it tries to be pro-growth, and uh, it does move the needle on that with uh, heavy investments in uh, pr pr heavy allocations for infrastructure, much heavier allocations for infrastructure and some other reforms. Mm -hmm. But I suspect that because of the Delhi elections, it also then uh, tried to be shown as more pro-poor. And so it tries to pay some uh, attention to how it is being more pro-poor. To some extent, it's also pro-environment. Uh, it's a competent budget put together by very competent people, uh, but I still have the feeling that uh, perhaps uh, more could have been done, uh, and it held back in a number of areas, uh, you know, with the pronouncements that the government had made, one would have expected a little more. But if, mm -hmm. uh, as Mr. Chari says, it is the first step, meaning that next the next few budgets will have more and more in that direction, and it lays the direction. It is uh, a good budget, uh, but given where we were, given that actually growth was not so low with the new revised GDP numbers, the new numbers have shown that India's growth was not so low when this right. government took power. Uh, yeah. Perhaps it could have moved it a little uh, further, but you know we can discuss and debate that. But on the whole, I think it is a competent budget. It is, a, in a way, a Gujarat-style pro-growth uh, budget uh, with heavy focus on infrastructure. Uh, but I still have the feeling that a lot more could have been done. But uh, this is a matter for discussion, of course. Thank you. Excellent. So thank you so much. Uh, in fact, yes, uh, as we get deeper into the discussion, that's what we would like to draw out from our eminent panelists. Mm -hmm in terms of you know what do they think else could have been there but still within the within the constraint of the time that we have in the next one hour 45 minutes we'll try to bring out these questions so that our audiences get a better understanding of the budgetary process and where india is heading and also the point of the revised gdp numbers we have a question on that sir i'll come to that in a moment later as we get into the q and a now may i invite and i hope and i believe we have a third speaker, Ambassador Yogendra Kumar, with us also, please, sir. Yes, I'm here on the line. Thank you, sir. Ambassador, may I take a minute to give a brief introduction? Uh, incidentally, uh, the detailed bios and profile of all our speakers are on our website. So for the benefit of our listeners and callers, uh, we are not taking much time to read out the complete profile of our eminent panelists. You can refer to a website, www.usimpact.com, to get deep, further details on their backgrounds. Here I'll just take one minute to read out his brief profile. Ambassador Yogendra Kumar is or was a former ambassador of India to the Philippines. He has also served uh, at the embassies of India in Moscow, as well as Under Secretary for Eastern Europe at the EMEA in New Delhi. He has also been the additional secretary for multilateral economic relations. In fact, now it's all about economic diplomacy, perhaps, at the Ministry of External <laughs> Affairs. Without much ado, may I please invite Ambassador Kumar for his uh, initial opening thoughts and comments, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, Mr. Uh, Rubinder Sajde. Uh, thank you for this. This. Uh, uh, this uh, I mean, to present. I mean, allow me to use your forum and to talk to such distinguished listeners. I also Please. want to uh, thank the previous panelists for their presentations, and I want to make. Uh, uh, I mean, my observations about the Indian budget. In a larger, so it's a larger setting. Perhaps you can say it's political economic uh, setting. And uh, the basic point that I see is that the, as the economic survey states, India finds itself in a sweet spot. Uh, the expression makes us take a deep breath, but also scares us. A still young government, energetic, decisive, and imaginative, is also in place to take decisions about our future. Something the rest of the world, especially the expatriate Indians are watching with bated breath and hoping that India will blaze uh, a glorious trail, equipping it to play its rightful role in the world. But the sweet spot is essentially an international circumstance, largely created by low oil prices, a circumstance which can change. Moreover, the global economy, <clears throat> including the countries which are India's major economic partner, uh, remains fragile. The U.S. is still recovering from the 2008 global economic and financial crisis. The European economy isn't, and the Eurozone itself is under threat. The Russian economy isn't doing well either, 
and instability in the heart bureau remains an immediate threat. And the Chinese economy is slowing down, and, Jap and, the, Jap and, the, and the Japan, or Japanese economy, is not out, the, out of the woods either. The domestic aspect of sweet spot also needs to be kept in mind. The economic environment is still driven by sentiment. The present leadership is on a political high, although the wave is flattening, as recent political developments in Delhi and Bihar show. These also translate, I'm afraid, uh, into redoubled efforts of the opposition to paralyze the parliament. Already the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs was forced under threat of paralyzing the Lok Sabha to clarify mm -hmm. his remarks, which were not considered unparliamentary by the Speaker. And the Madhya Pradesh Assembly was adjourned three weeks prematurely after passing the budget without discussion because it was also paralyzed. On the Index of Fragile States 2014, uh, brought out by the Washington-based nonprofit organization Fund for Peace, uh, India comes under the category of high warning, uh, as we, uh, although it's not too bad a thing if you look at the, the entire index. Uh, and that actually is also because some of the key organs of state, you know, this, this element where there's element of malfunction, which affects issues of governance, formulation, implementation of policies, and behavior of political class. The circumstances need to be recounted in, because the budget presented 28 February critically depends upon the implementation of the policy announcements and on the investor confidence, especially foreign, as the latter is a key aspect of the government's growth strategy. The budget has been well crafted and strikes all the right chords. As a starting point, it aims at, uh, as the Prime Minister has perhaps uh, given it a more pro poor showcasing, the Prime Minister mm -hmm. said the budget is progressive, positive, pragmatic, and prudent, with distinct focus on farmers, youth, poor, new middle class, and the armed nagrik, that's the common citizen. And it delivers, according to the Prime Minister, on growth, equity, and job creation. It is clearly an incremental part of the larger roadmap for accelerating growth, which depends critically on considerable legislative activity, banking on a cooperative legislature. The mm -hmm. Land Acquisition Bill, the Insurance Bill, the Labor Factories Act, and the Apprentices Act, Reforms Bill, etc., are still to be brought in the statute books, and these constitute the critical benchmarks to establish the new leadership's credibility. Many of the reform ideas have been up in the air for decades, but the strategy of which the railway budget pro provided the foretaste is characterized by heavy sovereign debt leveraging for a massive push on infrastructure development. Mm -hmm. and acknowledging that the PPP model has not worked. Through tax mm -hmm. reduction rationalization, improving stabilizing regulatory framework, banking sector reforms, the manufacturing sector is also to be encouraged. The agricultural sector is thought to be re-energized through aggressive, potentially costly social security commitments and is aiming at countrywide single agrarian market. The expenditure side is possibly thought to be improved through rationalization of subsidies and stopping of the massive leakages in the distribution of the government subsidy program. And lastly, mm -hmm. the government's growth strategy primarily being higher revenue through accelerated growth, the tax revenues have been projected modestly, and the fiscal consolidation targets, strongly needed, have been moderated. The 14th mm -hmm. Finance Commission also envisages lower tax share for the central government. The next mm -hmm. commission is also expected to take, is expected to place heavier expenditure burden on the central government. The hidden cost of increasing burden of sovereign debt, the hidden cost of social banking, and the low tax revenues can tip the balance if things don't work out as expected and if there's an adverse change in external circumstance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I think you've really gone deep or and dug into several of the you know silos which we are looking to open up and have a peek into for the benefit of our listeners and questioners. Uh, definitely, yes, I mean, there's a sweet spot in terms of the crude oil prices globally and also the uh, various points that you mentioned that, you know, about also the finance commission that more tax earnings would now be allocated towards the state. So how well equipped are the states to manage those additional finances? Uh, before getting into those questions, may I ask uh, Mr. Sashadri, please? Sashadri ji, uh, one yeah. key aspect which has been uh, recently in the news also is about the land acquisition bill. The question uh, yeah. I would have for you is that, and which has been coming to us is that, uh, the bill is apparently going to be brought up into the parliament uh, in the remaining part of the session probably. How do you see that yeah. uh, the progress on the bill affecting some of the objectives and targets of the budget as enunciated yesterday? 
do you see that in uh, impacting you know whatever the fate of the uh, LARR or the transparency bill is? What is your thoughts, sir? No, I, I no, I, 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 there are different opinions, and uh, I think the bill is concerned. Uh, in its earlier uh, bill, the, the, the UPA government, which the UPA government passed, right. uh, there were some lacunae in that bill. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, the BJP supported that bill, uh, but we did point out that uh, some of the lacuna will have to be corrected. But mm -hmm. now, a uh, lot of things have happened from the time the bill was passed and from the time ordinance was issued. In between, mm -hmm. in June 2014, after this new government took over, the mm -hmm. Prime Minister, Minister Modi called for a meeting of all the chief ministers. And mm -hmm. most of the chief ministers suggested that uh, the acquisition process uh, mm -hmm. is full of uh, loopholes. So uh, these acquisition process will have to be corrected, number one. Number two, trust of this government was Make in India. Now, Make in India is uh, it's an umbrella term uh, which uh, initially signifies five very different areas. The most mm -hmm. important area is uh, the creation of uh, more manufacturing facilities. The second is also utilizing the land uh, factor for uh, the industry. Because besides capital uh, and technology, the most important element of uh, the manufacturing sector is land. Mm -hmm. You cannot produce in the air. So if land is required, you need land which is practically not under agriculture and which is also not under irrigation. So. These are all some of the lacunas that had to be corrected. So we have done exactly that. But mm -hmm. now the party can take a political view of it. But there is an opinion within the Congress party also that uh, the party probably feels two things. Number one, uh, there should be no dilution as far as uh, the bill is concerned. Two, uh, it is basically a Congress bill and therefore they should get the credit for that. So any changes that are done, uh, probably, if these two things are addressed, uh, of course we do we do agree and accept the fact that uh, we we would be stepping on the toes of uh, a, a, a section of the society. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, then, uh, if you want to have something bigger, you have to be also prepared to make sacrifices of certain smaller things. But the prime minister has very categorically said that if the farmer's interest is being compromised in any way and if it is pointed out that lacuna will be removed from the ordinance and the bill will be corrected, number one. Number two, mm. the question is not who gets the credit, the question is what happens after this bill is passed, which he has reiterated a speech in the parliament. I, 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 I think we will have a consensus with the people, uh, that section of the society, the political and non-political section both. We will have a consensus with them and come out with a bill that is uh, more uh, useful for the manufacturing uh -huh. sector. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you know, you, sir, actually, we have included. Yeah, we have included. We have included uh, uh, certain areas such as rural electrification, for example, uh, which is an important area. And with uh, this kind of uh, setup. Uh, what we require is a greater amount of uh, infrastructure and rural electrification, even if you want to improve the lot of the farmers. And mm -hmm. Remember one thing, 65% of uh, India is rural, but that does not mean 65% of India is farmer. Every, right. Everything that is rural is not agriculture, and everything that is agriculture need not necessarily be rural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have to come out of these uh, cliches and think out of the box solutions. Mm -hmm. Very true, sir. Thank you. I think that's a very interesting point that you're making in terms of uh, probably the development uh, in the coming weeks uh, so that some solution would be found because uh, you won't believe, I think, about 30 to 40 percent of the questions that we have got uh, over the past week ever since we announced this program, as we announced, have been related to some way or the other land acquisition. Sure, that may be because you know this has been in the debate in the last couple of weeks. Before I go in uh, uh, or take the same question to our other two eminent panelists, I would want to ask you one more question, Sisatviji, uh, which is coming in. 
This relates to the report of the 14th Finance Commission, as also I think uh, uh, Ambassador Yogendra Kumar just mentioned, that an additional around 10% of the tax revenues collected are being passed on to the states for their utilization. Now the question that comes is yeah. that one thing, the question uh, one audience is asking us is that one thing that worries me is the capacity of states to implement which varies dramatically. Can the right. or how will the center take on some responsibility for equipping states to spend the money wisely? Uh, so I think that's a bigger question that, uh, and we all understand, you know, th there are differences in our state administrations across the country. So is there some thought on, you know, capacity building of states to, for, uh, to be able to use the monies judiciously, sir? I mean, that may be presumptuous, but... Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, this, this whole idea has been going on for almost, uh, say, about two years or so. And uh -huh. even during the UP government, we were thinking of these ideas. Uh, especially from the party point of view and from some other organizations point of view. You know, uh, we talk of federal structure. India has an excellent federal administration. Although the constitution is a unitary constitution, we have a federal administration. And mm -hmm. it, 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 it implies two kinds of federalism, political federalism and economic federalism. Political federalism is a great success as far as India is concerned. We have coalition governments, we have different governments in different states and different states, government in the center, center also, Congress, BJP, coalition, everything. So I won't mm -hmm. go into the details of political federalism. But as far as the economic federalism point of view is concerned, there was always the lacuna of uh, revenue to resource parity. So we had uh, places like Bombay, Calcutta, which contributes mm. something like uh, 15 to 25 percent of the GDP, That's because all some of the major corporations are listed in Bombay and Calcutta and Chennai and Bangalore. So their mm. contribution to the GDP is looked at as the contribution of that particular state, which is absolutely flawed way of looking at it. And these mm. these places don't produce anything, but the real mm. production center, if you see the resources are in Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, right. Bihar, and right. other such uh, areas and states. So mm -hmm. these states have been getting very less, number one. Number two, the uh, Finance Commission, uh, the, uh, earlier the Planning Commission, which was giving out the monies also, was more or less uh, modeled on the basis of uh, what the center requires the state to do, rather than what the state requires. For example, I'll give you, the mm -hmm. Prime Minister's talk project of uh, what we call the Pradam Gram Sadak Yojana, linking every village to the road. Now, mm -hmm. linking every village with the road is very important as far as Madhya Pradesh is concerned, as far as Uttarakhand is concerned, as far as Jharkhand is concerned, as far as Bihar is concerned. But mm -hmm. if you allocate the same amount to Kerala, it will be laughable because Kerala is one state where the village is linked to the road already. So mm -hmm. what is more important is you have to give money to the states for which they really require that kind of an amount. Now mm -hmm. this was one of the recommendations of the Finance Commission which mm -hmm. said that almost 32% of the center's revenue should be given to the states. We went to the extent of saying that their recommendation of 42% we have taken. So mm -hmm. now the states will get something like 5.7 like, uh, lakh crores. Mm -hmm. uh, out of uh, this fund, and mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the state's share will increase something like 51.55 percent. So, which means almost 60, 60 to 65 percent of the central revenue goes to the states. But your question is very important. What you wanted to know was, will mm -hmm. are the states competent? I think I, I think this is. Uh, I mean, states may not like it if we say this, but mm -hmm. there, there, there is an apprehension that some states may falter. They may mm -hmm. falter and they may slip into the idea of first utilizing the money for some projects which may not really be important for them. But mm -hmm. there, there has to be some sort of a give and take and a trust element in this. Mm -hmm. So that is why we have put in place a Niti Ayog, what was right. formerly if the, the planning commission has now been converted into Niti Ayo, and mm -hmm. every chief minister is part and parcel of the Niti Ayo. I see. So, yeah. unlike the earlier system, now the chief ministers are part of the planning and execution process both. 
so they can plan, they can execute, and they got the money. So I think with these three important elements on the part of the states, the states will do very well. That is what I am very hopeful and I am very positive that uh, the states will do very well. And there should not be any apprehension as far as the uh, executive capacity of the states are concerned. Thank you so much. So I think that would be, uh, I mean, that's a very good overview. You, you gave of economic federalism in India, which would have been quite helpful for many of our, I think, callers and listeners in. And the point which you mentioned of economic federalism and judicious usage. And of course, that the, the Niti IO, the new Aftar of the Planning Commission, uh, would uh, be definitely be involved in, you know, if not overseeing, but at least handholding uh, the effective implementation of these budgets. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I now invite uh, the response or comments uh, uh, from uh, from our next speaker, uh, 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 Mr. D. Uh, sorry, Mr. Ajay Chibber, on the same questions on the land acquisition aspect. What kind of an impact do you see? If or if not the land or whatever the fate of the land acquisition bill would be one and secondly again per uh, pertaining to this question of the additional allocation which has been made to the states and since you sir have been involved in performance evaluation and monitoring what would be your thoughts on that second question also mr. Chibber uh, please right thank you so much uh, I think um, the let me start with the second one because uh, I think that's that's a big game changer uh -huh. Um, I, I do think that the uh, the most significant game changer that has come out, I mean, it came out under the Finance Commission before the budget, but the the government has accepted the the findings of the Finance Commission and have basically built a budget around those findings. So I think this is very very significant because, um, as um, Mr. Chari already said, and as the the year that I spent in evaluating these programs showed very clearly that this mm -hmm. central approach to uh, development, where the central government designs programs, somebody in Delhi sits and designs the programs, which are the same for Kerala as they are for uh, Nagaland or for Rajasthan. I mean, it made no sense at all, and the. The needs are very different, the stages of development were very different, the capacity to implement was very different. So now transferring uh, you know, a large part of those resources into the hands of the states, and it was actually worse because not only did you have the center telling the states what to do, but because you had to put up matching funds to some extent by the states, you were even tying up the free resources of the states towards the scheme. And so mm -hmm. I think the complaints that were coming, including from the Honorable Prime Minister when he was Chief Minister, were very valid complaints. So I think this is a big game changer. Mm -hmm. And what is also, I think, uh, changed now is that, you know, we had a two-track sort of development. We had some states that were growing very fast, the richer states that were growing very fast. But over the last decade, we have seen that there's a kind of convergence that some of the less developed states have also accelerated their growth performance very rapidly. Uttarakhand is actually the fastest growing state. Bihar mm -hmm. has been growing very fast. Uh, mm -hmm. Chhattisgarh has been doing quite well. So some of the so-called lagard states, the, we used to call them the Bimaru states, have actually, not all of them, but a lot of them, uh, Odisha has been doing reasonably well. So they have all picked up and Rajasthan now uh, has started again to do well. So I think the idea that, uh, you know, uh, that that be because of this devolution we will end up then with greater divergence is not necessarily true. I think we will have more appropriate use of money now for the particular development needs of particular parts of the country. At least that's uh, the way uh, one would like to be able to see it. And certainly the old model where the center was deciding how to spend the money was not working at all. So we must mm -hmm. give this an experiment. I think mm -hmm. the Niti Aayog uh, can play a very important role by f becoming a kind of a reservoir of ideas and information on what is working in which parts of the country 
and how those ideas could then be utilized in other parts of the country also. You know, we have a, we have a kind of a unitary a structure where every state talks to the center, but very few states talk to each other. Uh, so we need a kind of a, a solution exchange, if you like, where somebody can say, okay, tell us what is working in different parts of the country in health or in education or in sanitation or whatever the mm -hmm. issue might be. And I think Niti Ayog uh, should and can play a very important role uh, in that exchange. But that said, I do think that some capacity building will also be needed. I mean, one of the factoids I'll give you is that uh, Jharkhand was only able to spend 60% of the money that was allocated to it by the center, whereas Karnataka would be spending more than 100%. You know. mm -hmm. So clearly there is a capacity issue in Jharkhand. But it's also, I think, related to how complicated do you make these programs. I mean, you might need a simpler educational program or a simpler uh, midday meal scheme in Jharkhand than you have in Tamil Nadu or in, you know, some other state. I mean, you have to deliver to, to the people. You don't have to make these things overly complicated. And you have to make the design of this, this scheme uh, related to the uh, administrative capability of that particular district or that particular state. By the way, mm -hmm. also there's very huge variation, not just across states, but across districts as well. For If you take UP, for example, such a large state, you have huge variations in uh, the way services are being delivered in different parts of UP itself. So some of it is related to uh, you know, intrastate rate variations as well, which have to be obviously taken into account. And mm -hmm. you'll find a pattern there as well that, you know, certain tribal districts will have uh, certain types of delivery uh, outcomes, whereas non-tribal districts will have different types of delivery outcomes. So it's not just a state-by-state state issue. I think it's also something a little more deeper where the center can perhaps provide or Niti Ayok can be useful in providing some ideas and solutions. But I do think that this change was badly needed and cooperative federalism, the way it is coming out and, you know, the way the 14th Finance Commission has now put money behind it and the way the government of India under the Prime Minister has accepted this. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this, is a, this is a kind of a sweet spot, if you like, that we have come to. Uh, which will change very fundamentally the way development is being carried out uh, in the country. And I do think that this will be a big, big game changer. Now, your other question was on the land uh, acquisition quick, bill. Yes, quick, yeah, yeah on, the land on the land acquisition bill, I do think that uh, the, the, uh, the bill that was passed earlier, which more or less all parties seem to support it at that time, uh, has become or will become a, has become a major constraint to our uh, goal of uh, making um, making India and to to increase uh, the share of manufacturing. I think uh, it is a major factor also behind uh, the as the economic survey says there are seven percent of GDP is is stuck in stalled infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has got to do with land acquisition. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, nothing has been said about that, obviously, in the budget. But, you know, that's a huge thing. And that also then spills over into the NPAs in the banking sector because all those stalled projects end up becoming huge problems for the, particularly for the state banks, because very few private banks lend money to the infrastructure sector. So all this is connected to uh, the delays in land acquisition, which have thrown the financial and economics of these projects, uh, you know, out of, uh, out of kilter. So I think we have mm -hmm. to get back to this uh, land acquisition bill um, and find a solution. Um, I mean, the ordinance way is not necessarily the way to go because I don't think the ordinance will give certain assurance to people of the certainty of the regime that under which they are, you know, going to be investing in these projects. So 
I do think that uh, this is very important. The putting more money into infrastructure uh, is 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 okay, but uh, and now I think the government says we'll first acquire the land, then we will uh, start putting money into these projects. But we still have a huge backlog of stalled projects, and for private investors to come in to attract more FDI. I think we will have to s find a way around this land acquisition issue um, in a sure. more serious way. And perhaps uh, the way to do it also is to allow states to, you know, take it out of the federal ambit and allow different mm -hmm. states to uh, start experimentation at the state level. I mean, a way could be found to do that, some mm -hmm. tweak in the land acquisition law that allows this not to become necessarily a federal issue but a state issue, then sure. I think certain states will start uh, pioneering in different ways in which they can address this issue. Uh, but I do think this will be, without this, I don't think uh, solving this problem, I don't think that the, um, you know, all the other things that we will be doing uh, will mm -hmm. be enough because I don't think public investment is going to be sufficient for uh, much of our needs. We have to get more private investment in. True. And without True. private investment coming, without the land acquisition bill being solved, I don't think that's going to be easy to do. True, True sir. Thank, Thank you so much, Dr. I think this issue of land acquisition is something which will keep on cropping up and we'll be looking out for it. Uh, meanwhile, may I ask now our uh, Ambassador Yogendra Kumar, uh, you know, uh, on a different question. Recently, India revised yeah. the which it uh, measures its GDP, right, due to which now yeah. apparently what was 4.5 percent is now uh, being talked about as 7.1 or 7.4 percent for this year. Now there is some confusion in the world markets regarding this. Uh, you know the world financial markets are finding this revision and they're not fully reconciled to it. What is your view that how is this, uh, how is India communicating this aspect? of the revised calculation of these GDP numbers because a lot of foreign players, investors, bankers would be looking at these numbers while considering uh, their actions in the Indian market. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I think before I address this particular point, let me also go back to the two previous issues uh, which actually were discussed by the two previous panelists. Yeah. I think uh, the larger sir. issue in... We are running. Yeah. We are running. Okay. Very quickly, I'll do that. I think, uh, I think ultimately, so as I see, it, you know, yeah, yeah. Ultimately, as I see, it really is a question of the way in which the political, let's say, the politics around these issues gets played out. So, and that is where the role of the parliament, the legislature, all that is very important. Because any reform program, any development program that the government of India or the state leaders are thinking, it cannot be done unless there is a legislative activity corresponding legislative activity for that. So I think in that context, the politics around land acquisition or the, uh, the insurance policy bill and so on and so forth, these are actually quite critical. Now, <clears throat> the, the issue of the Finance Commission, I think the points have been very well made by the previous panelists. I would just make one, I'll just make two points actually. I think of course there's no doubt that the states mm -hmm. are actually now very powerful. In, in many respects, they, they might be even more powerful than the Prime Minister or the central government because of the resources that come out and the fact that they have access to foreign capital and so on and so forth. Uh, but what it brings into sharp focus is the quality of governance in each state. And this quality of governance depends on the leadership of the state and that keeps changing. There's one point we have to keep in mind. That it just might be that it might be again a situation where there might be further aggravation of these inequalities because of the fact that India is an integrated economy, if they're larger imbalances or inequalities, regional inequalities in that case that itself is a factor which can uh, cause concern. And the second aspect of that also is that not only at the state level, but at the grassroots level, because all the reform and the growth that we're talking about, the robustness of the grassroots institutions is also very critical. And many times you find, on many occasions you find that the state leaders do not want to pass on the resources or the authority or the power to the, at the grassroots level. The panchayati raj institutions, for example, in one way they're hamstrung because of the fact that most states keep the panchayati raj institutions top of authority and resources. Now, coming back to your question regarding the uh, the uh, the new GDP, you know, calculation uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, formula, I think that is something on which I feel that uh, the central statistical organization, which is the one which actually is behind the revision 
of this methodology, I think they, I feel they should bring out an explanatory note as to <coughs> how they come about this. Because there is no doubt, even if you look at the economic survey, it does mention as to how it is not easy based on these, uh, on, on the current formula, I mean formula, it is not easy to interpret the data of the previous decades, for example. I mean the point is that whatever formula you apply, that formula should actually help you interpret the data not only of today and tomorrow, but also of yesterday. So that issue actually does be very important. But I do want to mention one another point. That is that the international investors or the international financial lending institutions, they don't just depend, look at the GDP figures per se to decide as to whether the climate for investment is, uh, is uh, conducive or not. They look at the overall health of the economy in terms of the, the debt burden, in terms of the inflation rate, in terms of you know, uh, the, the, uh, in, in terms of the uh, revenue deficit or the fiscal deficit or the external trade balance and so on and so forth. So it is never, I, I think the growth rate uh, figures mesmerize people like you and me. But the investors go into very hard look at the, at, at the, at, at the cold facts as they find. So you know, a whole lot of issues come up there, the laws, the, the, the efficacy uh, of, the, of the institutions or the agency which is supposed to help them in setting up their business, the reliability, the predictability of laws, the, the easy resolution of disputes, you know. So all these things actually matter a lot more. Then, 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 and then things like that. And one fact, of course, is very clear that the Indian economy is certainly on a bounce. There's no doubt about that. I mean, you can always uh, question the, 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 the height of the bounce, but certainly there's a bounce, there's no doubt about that. And therefore, the sweet spot that we find, I think the sweet spot needs to be very judiciously used uh, in mm -hmm. the larger interest of the country uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in a manner that we don't over leverage ourselves that can cause us trouble in the future, but mm -hmm. to take maximum advantage of it and to ensure that there is, as the Prime Minister has very rightly said, to, to have a, a, a well spread inclusive growth and, and, and where, you know, which is where the, 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 uh, the rebound in agriculture, the, the skills, uh, the skill uh, sort of uh, uh, renewal of the, of, mm -hmm. the, of, the, of the Indian, uh, the young population, all these factors actually are very critical, and, and I think they have to be, and they are really central part of the government's uh, strategy policy. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador yeah, yeah. Kumar. Uh, I quite agree. In fact, that leads me to a question which we've been, there's several questions, but I think which I would like to, uh, which is which is for uh, Mr. Sehad Richari, uh, which dovetails into what, in fact, Ambassador Kumar, what he was saying. Uh, Mr. Chari, uh, one of the key yeah. focus is, of this budget is to increase debt-driven investment, right? And the budget is proposing to take measures to deepen the bond market in order to promote investment, especially in infrastructure. And one of the methods there, which has been said, will be the structuring of something known as a public debt management agency, which will bring India's external borrowing and domestic debt under one single roof. Now, Right. There are some questions and some analysts are saying that this has been done maybe to clip the wings of the RBI. What is your, uh, what is your take or what, is your, what are your views on this? That uh, we do understand that you know, aggregating all the debt uh, under the single agency or making it a nodal agency will be useful. But there is also some discussion going on that this is being done to kind of a you know, little bit uh, clip the wings of the RBI which could have other repercussions also. And we think that this, this is a very important thing which should be clarified to international audiences, sir. So your views would be extremely helpful on this. Uh, yeah, you know, there should not be any fear as far as uh, the central government's uh, intentions are concerned. There is absolutely no uh, intention on the part of the government to in any way clip the uh -huh. wings of the RBI as you have said. Absolutely mm -hmm. none. But if you look at uh, some of our constraints, see, we we need something like uh, job creation, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. We have about 120 million people who will be joining the workforce in the next 10 years. Uh -huh. um, I mean, we will have to create almost, uh, say, two million jobs. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, this is something absolutely great. We have, mm -hmm. we have to give a boost for spending. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you look at the budgetary gap, we have a huge budgetary gap 
of mm -hmm. uh, say something like uh, the center's total spending is going to be something like uh, eighteen thousand crores. Uh -huh. and, uh, out of out of this, the biggest um, risk that the government is taking is as far as the uh, investment process is concerned. So obviously, this investment is not going mm -hmm. to come from only the local market or this investment is not going to come only from the foreign uh, markets. So if this investment has to uh -huh. come, uh, we will have to mm -hmm. uh, reduce the um, uh, reduce the interest rates and uh, we should be uh -huh. able to make uh, easy capital availability. So if this is to right. be done, RBI alone mm -hmm. cannot look into this kind of a gigantic problem because RBI is not part of the government. It will be very wrong to make RBI a part of the government. RBI, like judiciary, has to be an independent organ. RBI can mm -hmm. come into the picture if there is any corrective is needed. But as far as certain policy decisions are concerned, you cannot subject mm -hmm. all these policy decisions to a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a an agency However good mm -hmm. and however big that agency may be, uh, a, mm -hmm. an independent agency should not be part and parcel of the decision making process. So mm -hmm. it should be a judicial use of RBI. That is why what uh, the government is thinking of is bringing a monetary policy committee uh, mm -hmm. which, which will look into certain areas. Uh, if you talk of double digit growth, if you are talking of mm -hmm. housing for all, if you are talking of infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, improvement in infrastructure, and if you are talking in terms of um, creating growth, uh, creating mm -hmm. demand, and also meeting the sales part of it. Mm -hmm. So if you have to look at all these things, you will need more money, and if you want to need more money, you will have to have a different kind of a route for it. So that is how we are looking at it. And uh, RBI, of course, uh, is important, but if you look at uh, the total amount of money that has been pumped into the share market is concerned, mm -hmm. more than uh, the, uh, the, the shortfall of the share market or short, shortfall of the capital market has been because of lower household sales. See, mm -hmm. we had something like 36%, um, 36.8% 36 in 2007-2008, which right. went down to 30.6% 30 now. So we have to, we have to, if we have to go up to say again 36 point or 40 percent of household savings. Remember, mm -hmm. it is this household saving which actually adds to the capital market and right. which has a very low interest uh, return also. So mm -hmm. the return on investment from the household saving is much better than the return on investment as far as the foreign direct investment is concerned into the mm -hmm. capital market. So mm -hmm. <coughs> these. These elements, if you look into these elements, the primary market and the secondary market, we will need mm -hmm. a regime which will be free from constraints, but at the same time, which will be subject to correction by the RBI. So it is not mm -hmm. a confrontation between the government or the finance ministry and the RBI. Actually, they are mm -hmm. complementing each other. So by creating mm -hmm. an independent agency, we are, we, are, mm -hmm. we are actually insulating the market. We are insulating mm -hmm. the capital market. We are insulating the uh, other sector mm -hmm. from uh, vagaries of uh, time. So True. if there is always a problem, the RBI can come in, and mm -hmm. uh, as an independent uh, arbitrator, the RBI can function also. So it is actually a complementary role between the finance ministry and the mm -hmm. various departments of the finance ministry and mm -hmm. the RBI. They are not competing with each other. They are mm -hmm. not clipping the wings of one another. They are contributing mm -hmm. to one another from this point of view. We are making things easier rather, rather than making it as difficult as possible, which was the methodology being worked out now. Excellent. So that's a, uh, that's a phenomenally very lucid, you know, I think the clarification of this point, because this is an important point uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, you know, debt or the bond markets, uh, which of course India is looking at tapping and, you know, of course a lot of the debt is from the domestic market itself, but there's some portion which comes in from international markets. And this uh, this question has come to us actually from two, two different uh, questioners or callers, I mean, just yesterday or today morning looking at the budget. So I hope that your answer really does provide a clear 
a clarity uh, of the object on this one. This leads me to a second question to you, sir, it's Seshadri ji. Yeah. The question, and you mentioned yeah. about the look east policy of India initially in your opening remarks, right? Now, right. so right. once again, kind of combining the two or looking at this aspect of you know, debt funding or bonds or for our infrastructure yeah. projects, how much of a yeah. you know momentum do you see from the eastern markets coming into India, particularly let's say China, Japan, maybe Korea? How how much of a you know traction do you think this budget will give to uh, financial institutions in these countries for stepping forward with you know larger debt funding for India? You know, if you if you look at the uh, GDP situation. Uh, uh, India shares its GDP figures with uh, probably countries like uh, Russia, Italy, Brazil, UK, France, uh, France uh -huh. is uh, 2,900 billion dollars, India is uh -huh. 2,000 dollars. So uh -huh. uh, there are only three countries, China, uh, if you look at it, um, uh, US, China, Japan and Germany. After uh, USA, China, Japan and Germany, India comes into that bracket. Now, mm -hmm. if you compare this with the GDP of uh, the Southeast Asian country, mm -hmm. now there is a very skewed uh, way of uh, doing business. In the last mm -hmm. 10 to 10 years, almost 10 years, we have totally neglected our Southeast Asian partners. Mm -hmm. We have ceded uh, very strategic economic space to, mm -hmm. uh, say, China. Uh, mm. China has its own advantages. China has a huge advantage as far as the GDP is concerned, as far as per capita income is concerned. Um, uh, they have a low in inflation rate. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 fairly good uh, national savings rate also. And uh, the current account balance is also very comfortable as far as they are concerned. But if you compare the 2014 figures with uh, a projected figure, Except mm -hmm. population, we are not matching up to China anyway, unless, mm -hmm. unless it, this is very important, unless we bring in more partners from the Southeast Asian countries. Mm -hmm. And this is the importance, this is to address Mr. Former Prime Minister, Mr. Narasimha Rao, uh, who mm -hmm. introduced this idea, this element of Lukist policy, but mm -hmm. uh, for the last 10 years we have probably jettisoned this policy. That is the that there is a, that is the importance. Now, East has a great advantage as far as three important factors are concerned. The mm -hmm. first important factor is the market. Mm -hmm. The second important factor is the centers of production. Countries mm -hmm. like Bangladesh, Philippines, Sri Lanka have come up in a very big way as far as the textile market is concerned. Sri mm -hmm. Lanka is doing very well as far as the BPO market is concerned. Mm -hmm. Malaysian government is doing very well as far as the housing and uh, resource formation is concerned. Mm -hmm. And the entire Southeast Asia is looking up for a, a revision of its economic policy. Except for Singapore, no other country has been really able to do trade with all over the world as much as in, uh, Dubai mm -hmm. or some other country has done. So I think India mm -hmm. is geographically in a position to be the pivot of trade, mm -hmm. commerce, production, and also economic revival of the entire Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so obviously, mm -hmm. this is in no way competing with China. We are we are we are competitors as far as the market is concerned, as far as economic engagement with these countries are concerned. We are competitors. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we are now looking into our neighbors and mm -hmm. also the extended neighborhood in the Southeast Southeast Asia. And mm -hmm. it is with this idea that we are trying to strengthen the dark movements. And remember. Uh, this is one area which has the most contiguous geography, but a very divided society and politics. As far as True. society is concerned, as far as politics is concerned, as far as religious groups are concerned, as far as economic growth is concerned, it's a very disunited area, region, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, from Ankara to Bali, you can travel in a bicycle unhindered. But that, mm -hmm. that, that is where the comparison ends, that is where the advantage ends. The disadvantages are also very many. So we have a number of uh, regional outfits, regional organizations through mm -hmm. which we will be able to work and this is what is giving us an advantage, the Indian Ocean Game Association, the SAR and 
and the BRICS Bank and all these uh, uh, institutions would have mm -hmm. to be pulled together. The strength mm -hmm. of all these institutions would have to be pulled together. And this is what I think this government is going to aim for the next coming four to five years. And mm -hmm. with that view, I think we will have to compare the 2014 figures with 2019 figures and we will have to set a target for 2019 where we will mm -hmm. be able to really do something much better, not only for India, but also for this entire region. Excellent. So thank you so much. I think that's a very, once again, a very enlightened view of the geopolitical situation also, which combined with economic or geoeconomics, so to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question now for Dr. Ajay Chibber. Uh, one, firstly, okay, would you have any comments or if you'd like to comment on any of the two previous topics which we were talking about public uh, debt management or, you know, raising of sovereign debt for India? Any thoughts if you would have sort of a quick minute on that, please? Well, I think uh, I think the public debt office is a very good idea. Uh, mm -hmm. The question I think the RBI should be asking is, will it be an independent public debt office? Uh, but I th why it's a good I think you know as countries develop, all of if you look at the middle income countries and the developed world, all of them have uh, a debt office, and many of them have something called an independent debt office. There is a debt office that not only um, tabulates what the total liabilities, uh, outstanding liabilities of the government are, which is by mm -hmm. itself a hard thing to do given all the hidden liabilities in many of these infrastructure projects and other commitments that the government has made. So mm -hmm. I think the first task of this public debt office will be to tabulate what the government's uh, total liabilities are. You know, some of them are hidden in mm -hmm. various forms of guarantees and things that are dished out quite cavalierly um, under various project schemes, etc. Mm -hmm. So, but the, what countries move towards is an independent debt office, which is a debt office that not only um, uh, puts together the picture, but also sets, in a way, limits on how much the government can borrow and in a way constrains over <laughs> over borrowing by the by the government that mm -hmm. so that's that's very important i think because then the, the it becomes much easier for then the rbi to conduct mm -hmm. uh, monetary policy if the government side is being constrained but there's a bigger problem we have which is uh, we have la high public debt but we have we have been having declining, um, you know, debt service liabilities because we have, we are placing a lot of our public debt on the financial sector and we are uh, forcing the financial sector to hold a lot of our public debt at pretty low interest rates, which mm -hmm. makes it harder for that financial sector then to develop uh, in a natural way because a lot of the banks are then constrained by having to hold large amounts of public debt at very low interest rates. This is called financial repression. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's an issue that we need to look at as well, that you know, we are able to hold large public debt simply because we are forcing the banking mm -hmm. sector to hold a lot mm -hmm. of it, and, and that's something that needs to be looked at. But I do think that the establishment of the office itself is a very important first step and now mm -hmm. moving to other reforms connected with it will also be uh, very very important as well I think also on the GDP numbers let me say <clears throat> that you know the whole thing is a bit of a puzzle as uh, Mr. Kumar also said the if the num if the new numbers are accepted, then the UPA government wasn't doing so badly after all I mean they left an economy which was growing at about 6.9 percent mm -hmm. uh, rather than the four something percent that people were talking about with the old numbers so and and this year the economy without much effort will be then growing at 7.5 percent and then mm -hmm. of course you can project it out next year to 8.4 percent um, so if you're growing already at that rate then you know that's another part of the sweet spot that you're in 
uh, already and then the question is how much further do you need to go and of course you can set your ambitions much higher mm -hmm. but the numbers don't add up to uh, all the other indicators that we have if you look at tax receipts if you look at car sales if you look at credit outlook if you look at you know all the other um, physical indicators so to speak then you know you you don't see how things could have been going so well so it leaves a little bit of a puzzle but uh -huh. I think uh, the point was also made that people suspect China's GDP numbers but it hasn't stopped investment going into China Very so cool. I think we have to look at uh, these in that way that the, these battles on which are the right series will go on but what the investors will look for are other uh, factors that will uh, hmm. that will um, that will make a difference I do think that there is something which has been missed but which is very important which is the previous NDA government um, I, I do think that looking at our PSUs is very important that how how do we make this you know the Prime Minister's slogan is maximum governance minimal government minimal government also means you get the government out of the business of doing what the private sector should be doing which is running enterprises so but we have you know we have these Bharat Ratnas as we call them we have a very large number of still public sector enterprises and we have been doing what they euphemistically call disinvestment which is nobody wants mm -hmm. to use the word privatization in India it's a loaded word mm -hmm. so they call it disinvestment but also disinvestment is you sell you know small sh chunks of these companies but you never allow strategic investor to come in and take over the company completely but the first uh, under Prime Minister Atul Bihari Bajpayee we started that process when Mr. Shori was the disinvestment minister we mm -hmm. started the process of uh, strategic disinvestment which is you know selling off uh, um, more than 50 percent of the company to a strategic investor Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this government, I don't know, people haven't talked about it enough, but for the next year, 41,000 crore rupees will come from disinvestment, but about 28,000 crore rupees will come from what is called strategic disinvestment. Mm -hmm. And they have even identified five or six companies, I think Indian Oil Corporation, Alco, um, the dredging company, you know, several companies have already been identified for True. strategic disinvestment. So in a way privatization is back. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't call it that, we call it strategic disinvestment. But that is a very good thing because I think this will then first of all raise more money for uh, more what I call public goods infrastructure investment but also it will set the tone for a more private uh, sector led economy in the future. Hello? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chibber. Uh, I mean, that's so very true. In fact, you know, we have so many questions with us. And as you're talking about divestment or disinvestment and strategic disinvestment and several other aspects which we could have taken up, but we are kind of running short of time. And I also need to invite my colleague and chairman of US Impact, Sanjay, to take in a few questions towards the end as a wrap up. But before I do that, may I ask Ambassador Yuvendra Kumar a question which has come to us from uh, Seattle from one of our callers. Uh, he or she yes. is asking a proposal to set up five new power projects of 4,000 megawatts. The so-called, you know, the ultra mega power projects has been made in this budget, uh, which says, you know. But the question is that if you look in the past, out of the 12 UMPPs, apparently I think probably only two are online or operational. So what would be the fate of hmm. these new projects? Your thoughts, sir. Well, actually, I think uh, no, this is uh, an excellent question. Uh, you see, the point actually is that this time, in fact, in one way, the approach of the government is quite revolutionary, but it is it is anchored on is actually anchored on 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 a huge private sector investment and also sovereign debt leveraging into the into our economic growth. I think that mm -hmm. is why this particular uh, budget is different from the previous one. Now. But some, one of the smart things which has been suggested in this budget is that before these uh, projects actually can be put online or they can be actually you invite tenders or bids for them, mm -hmm. all the clearances 
for them would be would have been obtained already and they mm -hmm. use this very magical phrase that you know that it will be a plug and play kind of a kind of yeah. a, you know project uh, you know, launching which means mm -hmm. that the, the the all the requirements of taking clearances would be done uh, by the government itself before mm -hmm. let's say an investor is asked to come and actually make a bid for a project of, of those specifications so i think mm -hmm. that really is a big difference because as has been mentioned the previous by the previous panelists, the issue of land acquisition and environmental clearances and whole lot of these kind of things which actually come in there, they actually are uh, you know they are very time consuming. As you know, this Fosco steel plant project in Orissa, I mean it has been going on since 2005, if I'm not mistaken, and nothing has come mm -hmm. on, I mean, come off it so far. So mm -hmm. I think I think in that sense is an excellent idea. And 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 the, but all it means is that you know again we talk about uh, you know again we go go back to the debt management and so on and so forth. I think there is uh, considering the the fact that we want to take advantage of this sweet, sweet spot and so on and so forth. We actually have uh, to make a tremendous effort in capacity creation because even the nine ministries for them to actually tap the bond market or to see as to how they can leverage these things. You know that also requires. A considerable amount of capacity building, and that is at the national government level. I think further down the down the hierarchical chain, then these capacities become even more difficult to create. So, in that sense, it's actually uh, quite a uh, quite a revolutionary kind of way of looking at things. But it requires, you know, at top speed really to create these capacities so that you know all the opportunities that are being opened up as a result of these policy changes can be tapped, you know, uh, a by the government departments who have the task to actually mm -hmm. create these kind of assets and mm -hmm. to make sure that the investors when they come uh, come to invest in these projects they actually feel that they're actually having they done take uh, a good decision thank you so much ambassador uh, ambassador yeah. we do have a lot of other questions coming in and uh, i apologize to our callers and uh, people who have logged in via the telephone or online chat that we are unable to, we will be unable to take all your questions but we hope that this overall conversation which we've tried to do brings you some insights from some of the most eminent and involved minds about the processes happening beyond what we read in the newspapers or on the internet or on the web. Uh, without much ado, may I invite now my colleague uh, uh, Sanjay Puri, the chairman of US India Political Action Committee, for some of his uh, concluding maybe questions or thoughts with each of our pa eminent panelists. Sanjay, please. Thank you, Robinder, and uh, thanks to our uh, Wonderful panel. I uh, have to say that I have learned uh, a lot from this panel and obviously uh, it's gone into a lot of depth. Usually we hear a lot of these panels on uh, television. You hear sound bites, but uh, we really actually got to learn a lot. Uh, just to conclude, and I know uh, people are uh, on time constraints, and I want to just get a perspective from all three speakers because the theme uh, for the Indian Americans or the diaspora around the world that is locked in is can this budget make it easier or is there, does it make it more attractive for uh, the NRI community, the diaspora community to invest in India because they are looking at, you know, Prime Minister Modi has come to U.S. and has asked Indians to invest in Swachh Bharat, in the Ganga project, in other things. So from a diaspora perspective, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Chari, uh, obviously we would like to know from Mr. Chibber or Mr. Yogendra Kumar, just very briefly, because I know all of you are in a time constraints, does it help or hinder? Uh, that would be question one. The second would be that there has been a talk that we hear that there are no big bang announcements in this. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, there was an opportunity lost uh, to make some big bang announcements? And uh, that is just uh, some feedback that has come in. So. Those two things, and then we'll conclude just very briefly from each of you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chari? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Sanjay. You are doing a wonderful job. Now, uh, two questions you have raised. Number one, why there is no Big Bang announcement? Number two, what is there in it for the uh, uh, diaspora? So uh, now, coming to the second question first, why no Big Bang announcement? You know, this is not the time for any Big Bang announcement. And when we say Big Bang announcement, it all obviously means that we are talking about one or two announcements and the two are in one or two sectors. But uh, the biggest uh, the biggest bang, if at all you call it a Big Bang announcement, was made by the Prime Minister long before the presentation of the budget. And that 
big time announcement was called Make in India. So I think Make in India is the biggest uh, announcement that the Prime Minister has made, that this government has made, and this budget has also made. So obviously the Make in India process is one umbrella term that is going to really give a great push, not only to the Indian manufacturing sector in the Indian market, but also to the world community which is wanting to invest in India. So we are inviting the world community and also the uh, diaspora community to come and invest in India and be part of the manufacturing process. We just don't want them to be part of the vibrant uh, capital market. We don't want them to be just part of the infrastructure project. We want them to be part and parcel of the brick and mortar of the uh, Make in India project. So that Make in India includes everything. Make in India is something to do with the cars. Make in India is something to do with the vehicles. It's something to do with housing. It's something to do with electricity, with defense production. Everything under the sun comes under Make in India. So I think that is the big bang announcement that the government has made. So this, this, this entire budget, if you see, is continuation of the Make in India process, number one. Number two, as far as the investment and other opportunities for the Indian diaspora is concerned. The contribution of Indian diaspora to the uh, Indian economic development has always been very immense and very great. But they have had a lot of expectations from the government. So we have to look into three things, basically the short term uh, corrections that we have to make, the medium term and then, then the long term. So like we have to uh, remove the inspector Raj, we have to encourage modernization, upgrade our uh, legal system, uh, reduce the tax burden, and then uh, also give benefit uh, of uh, the falling oil prices to the common man so that his spending goes up. These are all some of the short term methodologies that we will have to work on. And in the medium scale, we will have to encourage FDI. We have to basically stop the flight of Indian capital abroad and then look at the, uh, uh, make more raw material available to the industry land for the industry. These are all the medium term programs that we have undertaken. And as far as the long term is concerned, we have to deal, do, do a lot of things as far as the long term is concerned. And we have to, in the long run, build our export competitiveness. If you want to make in India for the whole world, you will have to have a good export competitive market system. So it's a number of things. So I think if you divide it into these three aspects, uh, as I said in the beginning, this budget is one, it, it should be the, not be seen as a standalone budget. It is part of the next four year budget and this is the first step. And I think um, we would need more ideas and inputs from the diaspora, which has always had the, their heart in the right place as far as India is concerned. So I think your uh, organization should be able to give more inputs to the government through whatever sources are available. Thanks, Mr. Chari. This is uh, very, very helpful, and I'm sure our listeners are really appreciating that. And uh, just uh, any quick comments from our other two esteemed panelists, uh, Mr. Chibber or Ambassador Kumar, on this before we wrap up. I know it's uh, we've gone a little bit over time because of the tremendous amount of calls and chats that have come in. Uh, Mr. Chibber? Uh, Mr. Puri, thank Mr. you. Uh, I just to yeah. say that thank you so much for inviting me, and I think this is very useful, and I've, I've also learned a lot uh, on this panel. But just to say that I do think that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, as I said, the budget is a competent budget. It has moved the needle somewhat. And, but, I mean, it, the big game changers came outside of the budget. The, the you know, the Finance Commission uh, thing is a big game changer. The, I think the Make in India, a lot more needs to be done. So I think the budget in that sense was a bit of, uh, I wouldn't say a disappointment, but I do feel more could have been done. More aggressive reduction in the subsidy bill would have opened the door for more money for um, investment. Uh, the, in, the investment share, is, is the needle has moved very little. The revenue deficit of the government is still very, very high. Um, so, but if it, if, as Mr. Chari says, if this will be followed by successive budgets which you know keep moving this needle 
uh, then of course it's a good thing. But you know, in politics, given the political cycle, it'll get much harder in the last two years of the government. So this would have been the year where the expectations were very high, and I think the needle could have been moved a lot further than they did because I do think that in the last two years of the government before the next uh, big election it will become even harder to take difficult steps. So usually one expects, uh, you know, in cricket you expect a build up slowly till the last uh, 10 overs but in politics you expect the build up to come earlier. I mean you take the tough actions earlier to get the benefits later. So I, I do think that in that sense this budget could have gone further, but it has opened the door to a number of areas which I mentioned, privatization to um, more infrastructure bonds, uh, you know, the um, um, various uh, uh, programs that have been announced for um, Make in India. I mean, I, you know, so it's moving in the right direction, but given our political cycle, this, this year and perhaps next year would be the time to have taken much bolder reforms. But maybe they will come outside of the budget. I don't know. But uh, you know, in that sense, uh, I do feel that um, it's a competent budget. But uh, given the hype that we were expecting, it's a little bit uh, of a disappointment in that sense. Thank you. Great, uh, Ambassador. Did you have any concluding comments on the question I had? Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Puri. Uh, as I said, that. Uh, it's been actually a very stimulating discussion that I've actually uh, been, been part of. And surely your listeners, they want, they can write to me also in case they want any clarification. But here the point actually is that I agree with uh, Dr. Chibber that I think uh, in terms of policies, a lot more can be done for as far as market reforms are concerned. But I think at the same time, we have to give it to the finance minister that he actually has pressed all the right buttons in terms of the policy changes that are envisaged and I have no doubt that they'll be implemented very quickly. As far as the uh, NRI community is concerned, the Indo-American community is concerned, I think uh, that is very much a part of the present government. And as you know, Mr. Modi has gone all out to actually invite the uh, Indo-American community and the Indian diaspora to actually invest in India and its future. Uh, I think that is very much a part of the government's policy. And I could just draw attention to the fact that when President Obama came here, he actually made an announcement that the US government plans to actually create an Indo-American, I think, uh, investment forum or Indo-American vehicle for promoting investment in India. So I think in that sense, even the U.S. government is very much on board in actually facilitating investment by the Indian Indo-American community in India. And I think these are very promising leads, which I think our, our friends in the Indo-American community can certainly follow purposes. No, thank you very much, and you're absolutely right. Uh, President Obama did announce, and uh, you, you know, the diaspora is very, very energized and uh, hopes to continue to play a bridge role um, with India and its uh, hopefully uh, strong growth, which we believe is not just good for India, but it's also good for United States and the home countries where the diaspora lives. But uh, thank you all for uh, the uh, excellent uh, feedback, the remarks, and yes, uh, as uh, the ambassador said, we will uh, uh, put some of these questions and we'll, before we uh, forward them to you, we'll take your permission. We're not going to start bombarding you with emails, uh, which we never do. But thank you for a great uh, okay. dialogue and uh, we appreciate it. I'll turn it over to our host, Preston, to uh, conclude the program. Thank, thank you for joining the session today and I want to thank all the speakers, my colleagues, and attendees for taking our time and participate in this program. We had an in-depth discussion on the current India budget and we hope that it will do wonders going forward. Thank you once again for joining. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.